You ready? Luke chapter 16 is where we're going to be at. Uh, we're going to finish out uh, chapter 16 today, and uh, we'll continue on. Uh, just kind of give you a heads up, next week I'm going to jump backwards in Luke's gospel because I realized I skipped a parable. Uh, so there's a parable back in chapter 7 of Luke uh, where you'll probably remember the story where a woman is at Jesus' feet and she's crying and weeping and she's got her hair and she's cleaning Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair, you know, that story. Uh, he tells a parable right after that and he tells the parable to the thoughts of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are thinking some things and Jesus knows it, so he tells a parable to respond to their thoughts and they didn't realize he was reading their mind. Pretty cool story. And uh, so I, I, for some reason, just totally missed that when I was scanning through Luke to find the parables we want to cover. So next week, uh, we're going to go back and and catch that one because it kind of goes along with this theme of the Pharisees not liking Jesus because he likes sinners. So it's in that same kind of topic. So uh, that's what we'll do next week. Um, Now, Today, we're going to study the popular story of the rich man and Lazarus. How many of you have heard the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Okay, if you're raised in church, you probably remember that both of them end up dying, and one's kind of in the bad side of eternity, and one's on the good side, and they can see each other, and there's this kind of big story. We've kind of heard that. Most of us have, anyway. And if you're thinking, I don't know, I think I've heard this story, as we begin to read it, I bet you're going to go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard this somewhere before. Uh, If you grew up in church, you've certainly heard it many times, uh, especially if you went to revivals where people like to preach on hell. (laughs) They like to bring this up a lot. So anyway, uh, this story has some unique features. And now I'm going to call this a parable. And the reason why I call it that is because I believe 100% that's what it is. Uh, because he's in the middle of telling multiple parables, and I'm not going to spend a whole time, a whole lot of time trying to prove my point on this. So uh, I'll just kind of speak to that debate real quick, uh, and then we're going to just dive in, and, and I'll try to bring out what we can. Now, a lot of people today uh, in modern times, they read this story, whether they're preachers or Bible teachers, and they say it's not a parable, it's actually a real story. Jesus, telling, Jesus is telling a real historical story about a man named Lazarus and some unnamed rich man. Um, Now, there is another Lazarus in the New Testament. You read a lot about him in John's Gospel. There was Mary and Martha and Lazarus, right? And there's their family. And Jesus ends up raising Lazarus from the dead. Well, first he lets him die on purpose. (laughs) Then he shows up and raises him from the dead to prove that he is the resurrection, right? So that is not the same Lazarus of the story we're about to read. Okay, so just don't get that mixed up. But here's the deal. Most, a lot of people uh, tend to think that this is a true story because it's the only parable where Jesus mentions a name. All the other parables, there's just a certain man went off to a foreign country or a certain rich man had a servant. There's never a name to these people in Jesus' parable. But in this parable, suddenly, there's two names mentioned. There's Abraham and there's Lazarus. And people have thought, uh, many people have thought, well, if he mentions names, that means it's a real story. But here's the deal, and this is kind of my argument for this. Everything else in the parable follows the normal parable style that Jesus uses. So if you took Abraham and Lazarus's name out of the story, and you just kept it as a good guy and a poor guy and a rich guy, you, nobody would ever think, This is anything but a parable, okay? So this is a parable, and the other side of that we'll dig in as we go. Jesus is not making up a brand new parable. If you read the documents between your Old Testament and New Testament, we call that the intertestament literature, uh, this story was told many different ways. Two guys go down to Hades, and they're separated, some by the good and the righteous down there, and there's a conversation and all this kind of stuff. This is not a new thing Jesus is talking about. This was a cultural thing that everybody already understood. So this isn't a new thing. Jesus is not making up a new thing. Now, he does put his own twist on it, okay? And we'll see that as we go. Um, So here's what I want to do. I want to go through this parable, and I want you to uh, see if you can identify what is Jesus really trying to do here? 
Because what we normally do is we take this passage, this story, and we make it all about the afterlife. And the afterlife is not the point of this parable. Jesus is actually using their view of the afterlife to make his own point. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? All right, so we got to remember all parables are in a context. You can't rip them out of context and do a bunch of stuff with them. The context tells you why Jesus was doing this, why he was telling this story. They're all within a context. They're not random. None of the parables are random. They all have a certain context, and he's doing it for a certain reason. So as we've been learning in in, uh, Luke 15, this is the reason why he tells these parables. The tax collectors and sinners are all drawing near to Jesus, and they're listening to him. They have ears to hear. A lot of other people in the culture don't, but the worst people in the community, they have ears to hear. And the Pharisees don't like it because he's just hanging out with all the, all the wrong people, right? So they don't like it, and they've been angry at him, and we've been going through multiple parables that are in this same conversation, right? Uh, so they're mad, they're grumbling, this man receives sinners, and he even eats with them, which was even further uh, wrong in their minds. Uh, To sit down and eat with somebody meant you having a relationship with them, and this is like the most respectful and relational thing you can do, is eat with somebody in that culture. So they're upset with him. Y'all remember this context, right? They're upset. Uh, Back when when Marty taught us, when he did the uh, lost sheep and coin, he covered this context for us. All of these parables we've been covering for the last few weeks are about this. They're all being told about this. It's very clear when you just read it in context, okay? So what Jesus does, when, this is, when Luke tells us this is the context, this is what happened, Jesus goes on and he tells five parables, right? He does the lost sheep, and that's, he's directing that to the Pharisees. Oh, you don't like that I hang out with sinners? Well, let me tell you about a lost sheep and how, how we celebrate when we find those who are lost. That's the lost sheep. And the lost coin, that's also told to the Pharisees. And then there's the, what I call the lost sons, plural. You might have heard of it called the prodigal son. Okay, there's two sons in that passage, and both of them get lost in the story. Um, so those three are to the Pharisees. Then he turns to his disciples and tells the parable of the dishonest manager. But the Pharisees are still standing there listening. Because we're told, at the end of that, this. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, by the way, heard all these things, and they ridiculed Jesus. So they heard the parable he told. to. They're still standing there listening to all this stuff, and they know he's talking about us. He's talking about us right now. This whole time, all these parables he's telling, he's dissing us, the religious leaders of Jerusalem. They get it. They know exactly what Jesus is doing. Now, we read it in our modern time, and we yank it out of the context, and we're confused by the parables. You just put it back in the context, you start to see what Jesus is doing. Jesus is, Jesus is publicly taking shots at the most respected religious leaders of Jerusalem and Galilee. Jesus is confrontational. Okay, so the, the little nice baby in the manger, you know, he grew up to be a guy who made some enemies. All right? Let's not forget that he flipped over all the tables in the temple courts and drove people out with a whip that he made. He sat down and made a whip while he was watching them change the money and sell things and make profit off of people. That's good. You like that version of Jesus. Men, men, you like that version of Jesus, right? He sat down and spent time making, carefully making his own whip so he could whip some people out of the temple. Okay, I like that way more than y'all do, apparently. I just think it's awesome. So he tells all these parables, and the Pharisees get it. They're like, yeah, we, we understand he's talking about us, but Luke gives us a clue. He says, by the way, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they're lovers of money. They're rich people. The Pharisees were loaded. They dressed real nice and all this fine linen, and they walked through town, and they said their prayers out loud in front of everybody and stood on the corners of the busiest streets to say their prayers so everybody would be impressed of how godly they are and how good they can pray. And they were rich. They were lovers of money, and they were rich. It just so happens that the very next thing, the very next parable Jesus is going to tell is about a rich man. 
to the Pharisees who were rich men who loved money. Do you see what Jesus is doing? Okay, the, the dishonest manager parable right before this is about a rich man and a dishonest manager. Then Luke's going to say, by the way, the uh, Pharisees hated Jesus even more for this because they loved money and they didn't like it when he picked on rich people because it was them. So then he's going to tell a parable. But before we get into that, I want to show you something, and I want this to just stick in your head. I'm not going to explain it first. I'm just going to stick it in your head and then see if you notice what's going on, what Jesus is doing. Genesis chapter 15. I like to go back to the Old Testament and find what Jesus might be doing with the Old Testament and his stories. Okay? There's two names mentioned in the parable we're about to read. Two names. Now listen to what Genesis chapter 15 says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, who will later be called Abraham. Right, so Abram is exalted father in Hebrew. Abraham is father of a multitude. All right, God changed his name. So he's already told Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You're going to have kids. Now his wife hadn't had kids, and they're old in age by this point, but God promises him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Abraham. Chapter 15, the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. I'm your protector. Your reward shall be very great. Good news, yeah? Yeah. But Abram said, O Lord God, well, what are you going to give me for a reward? For I continue childless. Remember that promise you made me about making a great nation? That's kind of hard to do if you can't have kids, Lord. And the heir of my house is Eliezer. That name means God helps. El is God. Eitzer in Hebrew means help. It's the same word used of Eve when God creates Eve and makes her a helper to her husband. It's Eitzer. Eliezer. So we have Abraham and we have Eliezer. And well, I'll just say it like we would want to say it in Taylor County. All right, Eliezer. All right, so we got Abraham and Eliezer. All right, now, so Eliezer is a servant in Abraham's house. He is at Abraham's side. Make sense? Yes? That's the only person he's got to leave his stuff to because he's got no son yet. All he has is Eliezer, Mr. God helps. Now, just, just store that away as we read Jesus' parable, and you might see what he's doing here, okay? I've read this parable my whole life. I never made this connection until this week. It hit me. Boom. I see what he's doing. All right? Here we go. You ready? You look sleepy. Wake up. Come on. This is a good one. All right. You know, Pharisees who love money and don't like that I hang out with sinners and forgive people that you don't like and all that kind of stuff, you know, there was a rich man kind of like you Pharisees, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. You want to just guess what the Pharisees like to wear in public? Purple is extremely expensive and very rare. You had to have a lot of money to buy purple fabric. Okay, It was not produced in Jerusalem. It was, it was uh, imported in from up in uh, Asia Minor around uh, Laodicea and places like that. Uh, so you had to have a lot of money. And the Pharisees had money, and they liked to wear purple because it made them look like royalty. Right? Anybody wearing purple in here today? No, you wouldn't raise your hand now if you were. Now, uh, <laughs> so there, this rich man, you know, maybe he's a Pharisee, maybe not, was clothed in purple and fine linen. And by the way, purple and fine linen would have been what priest wore. Yes? Yeah, okay. And by the way, so he's got not really nice clothes. And he feasted sumptuously. You use that word lately? Me neither. I don't think I ever have. Uh, every day. He's just in excess, gorging himself, feasting every day, extravagant feast every day. This was odd for even rich people in that culture. You don't feast every day. You feast for special occasions, right? 
You kill the fatted calf because the lost son came home. You don't feast every day. You only feast for religious feasts and for special situations. So he's feasting every day, which was obnoxious to the audience Jesus is talking to. And at his gate, now just, just hang on there for a minute. If he's got a gate, that means he's got walls. He's got a high wall around his entire property, and, he's, and it's gated. He's built his own gated community for himself. Yeah, see what's going on here? Okay, so he's shutting himself out. He's put up a wall of separation between himself and these poor pitiful people that live outside his little gated community for himself where he feasts sumptuously every day in his purple and fine linen. Why do you even dress like that in your own house? But he does. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Eliezer. It says Lazarus here. That's what our English Bibles do with it. His name is Eliezer. Sound familiar? Eliezer, Genesis 15. And who was Eliezer's, who, who was he a servant to? Abraham. He was at Abraham's side? Yeah. So the Hebrew name for Lazarus is Eliezer, okay? And he's a poor man, and he's covered with sores. So what disease, what disease does he likely have if he's covered in sores? Probably a leprosy-like disease. And who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. That desire to be fed, in Greek, is the same exact phrase used of the prodigal son in the previous parable. Who desired to be fed by the pods the pigs were eating. Remember that? And no one gave the prodigal son anything. He couldn't even eat. They wouldn't even give him pig slop. That was the prodigal son. Now here's poor Lazarus, Eliezer, whose name means God helps. And look at the situation he's in. Does it look like God's helping him? Just hang on. He's got some kind of leprosy, and he desired to be fed just with the crumbs from the sumptuous feasting of the rich man. If the crumbs could just, if he could just eat the crumbs, he'd be happy. Most likely this was the bread that he would, a person would wipe their hands with. So when they're eating meat and things like that, they get all kinds of juices and stuff all over your hands. Y'all like fried chicken, right? You know how you get that grease all over your hands? And I'm making you hungry. I better stop doing that. Um, so what they would do, instead of taking a cloth and wiping their hands, they'd take a piece of bread and they'd dry their hands off with it and they'd kind of roll it up and they'd throw it under the table. That was a common practice back then. And the servants could clean it up because us rich people in purple and fine linen we don't crawl under tables. We have servants for that. So he's desiring, I, if I could just get fed with the bread napkin of the rich man. He's in a bad situation. Mr. God helps is in a helpless situation. And moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. He wishes he could just get the crumbs, the food off of the rich men's table, but Lazarus is actually the food for the dogs. He's in a bad situation. Mr. God helps. He's in a bad situation. Eliezer, he's poor. Okay, let's just look at his condition here. He's, he's crippled. You missed that part. But if you pay attention to what the text says, it says, at his gate, at the rich man's gate, was laid a poor man. Somebody brought him there. So he's probably crippled. He can't walk. He's been laid down at the rich man's gate. He's poor because he's called a poor man. And he's got some kind of unclean disease. Now, could un people with unclean diseases go into the temple to worship? No. You couldn't even walk through the marketplace because you had to stay so many feet away from everybody, and you had to scream out, unclean, 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 to let people know you were coming through so everybody could get away from you because you might be contagious and people would cover their mouths, right? So he is in the worst place you could be, both socially and religious speaking. The Pharisees would have had nothing to do with this guy. He's got sores. Dogs are licking his sores. Dogs were unclean animals in their mind. So if you've been around dogs, you need to be purified 
so you can be clean again. So this guy's got an unclean disease. He's being licked by unclean dogs, and he's poor, and he gets laid at the gate of the rich man. Do you see the setup here? And the next thing tells us this. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Eliezer goes to be at Abraham's side. Genesis chapter 15, who's at Abraham's side? Eliezer. Do you see how Jesus is taking two very familiar names from the Old Testament? And he's telling a story. This Lazarus, this Eliezer in this story is not a historical figure. He's using a past figure and telling a story that was common in that culture. So the poor man died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. That would be where the, where the good righteous people go, right? They get to go hang out with Abraham until the final resurrection. The rich man also died and was buried. You notice the rich man got buried? The uh, poor man got carried? Yeah, he's pointing out here, there's a big difference in social status. The poor man doesn't even get buried. The angels come and carry his spirit off to the afterlife. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, that's the place of the dead, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus, Eliezer, at Abraham's side. Now, um, I just need to tell you this before we go any further. The story of people descending into the underworld was a common story uh, about two to three hundred years before Jesus was born. But you will not find that in the Old Testament. So you will not find this idea that Hades, or Sheol in Hebrew, had two compartments, and there was a separation in between them. You won't find that in your Old Testament. You will find that in writings that were written between the Old Testament and the New Testament. These were Jewish writings. Many of them, we don't consider them Scripture. Nobody ever did actually consider them Scripture in the Jewish world. But this story about there being two compartments in the afterlife, so to speak, comes from that period of literature. It's not in your Old Testament. And Jesus is picking up what his audience already knows about, and many of them believe this is how the afterlife worked. He's taking that, and he's telling a story. Do you see? So it's not like Jesus is teaching us about the afterlife here. He's using their version of the afterlife to make a point about this life. They're super focused on the afterlife. He's saying... No, what you do in this life matters. But he uses their version of the afterlife to tell, to tell the story. So in this picture that Jesus has kind of painted, that there's a good side where the righteous people go, and there's a bad side where wicked people go. And apparently uh, in this story, there's torment on the bad side. There's punishment of some kind. Okay? Make sense? Now remember... It's not that Jesus is saying this is what you all ought to think about the afterlife. And even if you think that is what he's saying, keep this in mind. This is before the cross and resurrection. Jesus is telling this story before he dies on the cross and rises from the dead and takes the righteous people who had been in Sheol, takes them and ascends to heaven with them. So now the rules, even if this is the way it worked back then, that's not how it worked after the cross and resurrection. For those who are in Christ, when we die, we go be with Christ. We don't go to some holding tank and await the resurrection. We go to be with Christ. And where is Christ? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's at the throne of God. That's where we go, okay? So even if you think Jesus is saying this is how it works, well, he changed the rules after the resurrection. So, but I don't think he's teaching this anyway. I think he's picking up a cultural story. All right, anyway, so look what's going on here. In the guy's life, the rich man put up a wall that separated him from poor people like Eliezer or Lazarus. You see that? The rich man made a separation between him and those poor puny people outside. 
What we're about to learn is that in the next life, after they've died, there's also a separation. But the roles have been reversed. So in torment, this rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, Eliezer, he's at his side. Look what happens next. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, at first glance, you think, oh, he's had a change of heart. He, he's now in punishment, and now he wants to repent. Okay? If, if it stopped there, I'd say maybe. But uh, look what he does next. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to come help me. Send Lazarus to go dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Now we read right past this, but I want you to consider what's going on here. Even in torment, in his own punishment for his own neglect of the poor, which means he's neglecting God's word who tells him to take, that God's word, the Torah, told this man, you take care of the poor. That's what you're supposed to do as an Israelite. You share your things. You share the crops of your field. You share uh, your home with people when they need it. You care for the poor. And he's neglected that his whole life. He didn't care about the poor. And now he ends up in this situation, and here's what he wants to do. He still wants to tell Lazarus to be his servant. So we missed that. He's looking across, and he sees Eliezer and Abraham hanging out, and they're just having a good old time over there in paradise, Right? And he's over here on the bad side with all the unrighteous people, people just like him who, who never cared about what God wanted. They only cared about building their own kingdom, and they neglected everybody else around them. And he looks across that divide, and he sees that going on, and he goes, well, how did he get over there? Because the rich people in their mindset, now listen closely, in this culture that we're reading this in, Rich people in the Jewish culture were blessed by God in their mind. If you're rich, that means God is blessing you, and you certainly are going to end up in paradise because you're blessed of God. And if you're poor, and specifically if you're poor and you've got a disease and unclean animals are eating your disease off of you, then here's what that means. That means you're cursed. God apparently don't like you. And you've apparently done something really bad in your life, or either your parents did something really bad, and God's making you pay for it. That's why you're poor and diseased and all this. Does that make sense? Right? That's what they thought. The people who are listening to Jesus in this story, that's their mindset. Jesus is taking their mindset, and he's saying, nope, it actually works the opposite way of what you think. Riches or poverty have nothing to do with how much God loves you. Can I just say that again? I want to preach on that, honestly. Riches and poverty have nothing to do with it. It doesn't. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're blessed by God. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you're cursed by God. God loves us all the same no matter what we've got. The question is, what do you do with the situation that you're in? What did the rich man in this story do? The rich man ignored everybody else who were in need, and he overindulged in his own wealth. But in this afterlife scene, the roles have been reversed. And this was shocking. This was shocking to Jesus' audience. So what's he doing? He's over there. He's getting punished. He thinks, okay, I know what I can do. There's that Lazarus guy over there. If you, you know, puny, poor Lazarus. Somehow he ended up on the good side. That's messing up my theology. But since he's there, uh, hey, Abraham. Send Eliezer, Lazarus, to dip his finger in the water because in that mindset, the stories of the intertestament literature said that there was a separation between the righteous and the evil, and what was in the middle was the river of life. The river of life. You can read this in First Enoch. It's an intertestament book. There's a river of life in between the two areas. So what is this rich man doing? He's saying, hey, hey, get Abraham... Uh, not that I can, you know, who thinks you can tell Abraham what to do, but this guy thinks you can. Abraham, you tell Lazarus to give me some of the water of life. 
What's he trying to do? He's trying to get Lazarus to help him get out of there. He's ordering him around. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here. God has helped him. The guy whose name means God helps. Nobody else helps, but God helps. You get it? See what Jesus is doing here? But he is now comforted here, and you are in anguish. (laughs) Hey, remember in your life when you were feasting sumptuously every day, and you didn't even give your crumbs to the poor sick guy outside your gate who was by your gate? Here's what that means. If he's by your gate, every day when you leave your house, you see Mr. God helps. And maybe, you know, maybe the rich man thought, well, your name means God helps. Maybe God will help you. We'll pray for you. Right? I'm, I'm headed to the temple. I know you can't go in the temple because you got all the sores and all that, you know, and you got dogs here and all that kind of thing. Uh, you can't go with us to the temple. But while I'm at the temple, Mr. God helps, I'll ask God to help you. Maybe that kind of thing went on. We don't know. The point is, there was no way this rich man missed Lazarus sitting at the entrance and exit to his compound. He's literally intentionally ignored a man in need, a fellow Israelite, his entire life. But Jesus says the roles get reversed because in the end, there is a judgment. We don't like to talk about this much, but I need you to understand this, and I need us all to be really clear about this. In the end, we all face judgment. And uh, whether you are rich or poor isn't really going to matter. Yes? I'm kind of glad because that means we're all equal. You want equality? You're going to get it. (laughs) We're all going to be on the same playing field. And the only hope we will have on that day is when they say, why should I let you into eternal life? We can point at the one sitting to the right hand of the Father and say, he said I could come. Because he's, he hung on a cross. And just like the one to his right, or maybe his left, I can't remember which one the criminal was on, uh, there was one criminal who said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged him as the king of the universe. And what did he say to that guy? Well, you need to get your theology straight now. Do you, do you understand what that means? Does that, do, do you understand all the implications of that? We need to have, you need to go to a Bible study so you can understand this. Um, oh, and by the way, you, you've got to get baptized. Did Jesus say any of that to him? No, he looked over at that man and said, today you will be with me in paradise, the heavenly garden of Eden. That's what he said. So you know what that guy said when he showed up at Judgment Day? When, when he got to stand before God a few hours later when he died along with Jesus, he got to stand next to Jesus. And they said, well, why would we let you in? You're a criminal. He said, I could be here. Isn't that cool? Right? So this is the same thing. I mean, Jesus is saying there's a judgment day for all of us. And just like this rich man ended up where he ended up, we're going to end up somewhere. Right? So he says, look, in your lifetime you had everything. You had all the good things. And Lazarus had all the bad things. And you didn't care about him then, but now look what's happened. He's comforted. God is helping. Yeah. God has helped him. But you, no help for you. And he says this, and besides this, this is still Abraham talking in the story, and besides this, between us and you is a great ravine, chasm. It's a word for great ravine or great river that you can't cross. There's this great river in between us that's been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Do you you see what Jesus is doing? Remember back earlier in the story, the guy had a wall to separate him from Lazarus? 
And now Jesus is saying, now look what happens in the end. If you put up walls and separate yourself, then you'll end up in a place where you're separated from those who God helps. Does that make sense? This is a brilliant story that Jesus is telling here. So there's, there's a division. Listen, if you separate yourself from God's people, from, from the righteous people that God has declared righteous, his family, if you separate yourself from them, beware. You might be separated in the life to come. And then the rich man has a total change of heart. Just kidding. That's not at all what happens. <laughs> He says, okay, so we're separated. We can't go across. I can't get the water of life and go across there. I, I get it. You can't send Lazarus over here. He said, okay, then I beg you, Father Abraham, to send him to my father's house. He's still trying to get Lazarus to go do something. He's still telling Abraham what to do, and he wants Abraham to tell Lazarus what to do. Do you see the pride and arrogance in this guy? The afterlife hasn't changed him a bit. Here's something we need to understand, and I think we can take from this story. Those who end up, for all of eternity, separated from God, will be those who never wanted to be connected with God to begin with. They're the ones who said, I want nothing to do with you. And God says, okay, I'm not going to force myself on you. If you don't want me, I won't force you. But if you want, if you want nothing to do with me, then that's what you're going to get. Nobody ends up there because God wanted them there. They end up there because they wanted to be there. They just didn't want to be with God at all. Same thing goes with this guy. He's rejected everything that God's told him to do as an Israelite. He's totally ignored all of that and done his own thing, built his own kingdom, got the nicest clothes, ate, ate the best food every single day. He feasted all the time. And there's no mention that anybody was with him at the feast. You ever feasted by yourself? Yes, you have. <laughs> we all have, right? I feasted on a steak and shrimp last night. It was awesome. Um, now, look what he says. All right, Abraham. I still need you to tell Lazarus what to do for me. I need Mr. God helps to help me. So send him to my father's house. I don't know how he thought you could pull this off, but send him to my father's house, for I have brothers. I have five brothers. How many uh, books are in the Torah, in the Old Testament? Might be a connection, might not. Just I like throwing stuff in your head and then not explaining it. There you go. For I have, Jesus did it, okay? I'm just trying to be like him. For I have five brothers. So and here's why. Because I need Lazarus to go warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. I don't want them to end up on this side with me, so send that Lazarus guy to go warn them. Well, his five brothers are also Israelites. They've got the law. They've got everything they need. And if they're rejecting it just like he did, it's going to be the same outcome. But Abraham said, you know, your brothers, your, your five brothers, they have Moses, that's the Torah, the five books, and the prophets, and let them hear them. They've got the word of God. Why, why would we go through all the trouble, Mr. Rich Man, of sending somebody back up to the surface to tell your brothers what the word of God already tells them? Do you see what Abraham's saying here? Well, they've got, they've got the information. It's not that they don't have enough information. They've got all the information, right? Now look at what the rich man does next. Look at this. And he said, no, Abraham. No, Father Abraham. Father's in here. You ever had your kid say no to you? Probably only happened once, <laughs> right? Or maybe a few times. But because it, it does take them a while to learn, you know, that, that part up here is not done cooking yet, so... Uh, but just think about it. There was a time where Jesus, uh, Peter also said to Jesus, No, Lord. Did you get the oxymoron there? No, boss. 
Employers. You ever had an employee tell you no? <laughs> That's what's going on here. He's looking at the most prominent historical figure in all of Israel's history, and he's arguing with him like he knows better than the founder of Israel, right? God started Israel with Abraham. I'll make a great nation out of you. Well, all I've got is this servant called God Helps. Are you going to help me? <laughs> He's the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was changed to Israel, right? And you're going to argue with him. This rich man is the most arrogant person I've ever heard Jesus talk about, right? And who is the rich man a symbol of in this parable? The rich Pharisees who are lovers of money. And they knew exactly what Jesus was doing. They're tracking with the story. He says, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. They're not going, they don't, they don't care what Moses and the prophets said. They're not going to do any of that. No, Father Abraham, they're not going to do any of that. But if you send Lazarus back from the dead, they'll listen to him. Now, is there someone, can you think of a person who at the end of Luke's gospel, okay, now the other Lazarus guy, he's in John's gospel. We're not talking about him. Can you think of a person who's going to be raised from the dead at the end of the gospel story? Who's that? That's Jesus. And who refuses to believe it? The Pharisees. The rich man. So just tuck that away. Let's look at the next verse. Abraham said to the rich man, look, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, you know, the whole Old Testament that was written directly to them, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to be crucified, put in a tomb, and I'm going to go to this place that this story is talking about, this Hades place, and I'm going to shake things up down there. And I'm going to take a bunch of people out with me when I rise from the dead and ascend to the Father. Matthew describes it. It's a very weird passage in Matthew 27, I think. But at the resurrection, the tombs were opened, and they saw the Old Testament saints walking around town. <laughs> Did you imagine that? It's the walking dead, literally. Yeah? Jesus is going to die. He's going to ride th during that three days. He's going to go down there and he's going to say, Hey, all you Old Testament saints, remember that Messiah you're looking for? Remember that prophet like Moses who was supposed to come? Here I am. And they're probably all like, Wow, now what? And he goes, We're getting out of here. You're all getting out of here. You've believed in God's scriptures. You've believed in his word. You've been looking forward to the salvation of God. Well, I'm here, and the salvation of God, is his name is Jesus. And that's me. And in a few days here, I'm going to round y'all up, and we're going to go hang out in the paradise of God around God's throne, and you're going to see him face to face. Abraham and all those guys hanging out down there who never saw God's face and longed for the day, they would. Jesus shows up, solves that problem for them. And he's going to rise three days later from a grave, and guess who's not going to believe it? The rich Pharisees. Jesus has given them a hint. Hey, even if somebody rose from the dead, guys, you still wouldn't believe So what is this parable meant to tell us? Well, I don't think it's meant to describe to us what the afterlife is like, afterlife is like, because that's not how it works anymore anyway. Now maybe he's describing what how things used to be before his own sacrifice and, and resurrection. Maybe that's true. It doesn't matter to me either way. What matters to me is the main point of what Jesus is getting at. If you put up walls between you and the people who God helps, then maybe in the afterlife there's going to be a wall between you and the people who God helped. See, this is serious. 
In context, he's telling this to the Pharisees. But the same is true for us today because everybody, everybody, if you fell asleep, wake up and listen to this, okay? Everybody in here can be a Pharisee just like that. Yes? Yeah. Here, here, I'll prove it to you. Let somebody who is either in your family or in your church family, let them mess up real bad and see how quick you turn into a Pharisee. Now, if it's a sin that, you know, most everybody commits, it'll be fine. We forgive people and that kind of thing. But let it be a sin you've never struggled with. And let's see how quick the Pharisee comes out in us. I've been there. I've been the Pharisee. Judge people. I thought, I'd never do what they just did. By the way, don't say that. I'll just tell you by experience. You sit around looking down on people who do certain sins that you think you would never do, and you let that leave your mouth. Oh, I would never do what they did. You better get your seatbelt ready because you're fixing to do what they did. It won't be long. Because as soon as you utter those words, you have elevated yourself above someone else. And guess what God says about those of us who do that? Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves, God will exalt them. So you can put yourself up on your high horse. God's just going to knock you off of it. Ask the Apostle Paul. He was literally riding a high horse to go persecute Christians. And Jesus showed up and knocked him off his donkey. I'll let you fill the blank in there. <laughs> All right. And, he, and what did he do to Paul? Mr. Rich Pharisee man. Paul, who are you persecuting? Why are you persecuting me? Paul says, who in the world is this? He says, oh, oh yeah, you've never met me before because you were from a different place and you moved here recently. Okay, that's right. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. I just showed up as a bright light, which he would have associated with the glory of God because he's a Jew. I show up as a bright light so powerful that I knocked you off your donkey. And you can't see anymore for a few days, by the way. And I'm Jesus, whom you are trying to kill. You are messing with me. What does Paul think in that moment? I'm messing with the wrong dude. Because I didn't see nothing, and then I saw bright light, and I got knocked down. And I hear a voice I'm messing with the wrong guy. And Mr. Rich Man Pharisee totally changes and becomes the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. And by the way, many Pharisees turned to follow Jesus, except for those in the highest positions who had exalted themselves. They refused. Caiaphas, the high priest, he refused. By the way, we've got a box with his bones in it. You can go to Jerusalem and look at him. We found his grave. We found his ossuary box with his bones in it. It's a very ornate, very wealthy, very rich man-looking box with his name on the outside, the high priest Caiaphas. And his whole family was in that tomb. We found every one of them. Caiaphas still sits in a tomb. But the one Caiaphas sentenced to death, he's not in a tomb anymore. He came out of a tomb, and Caiaphas still wouldn't believe it. So what we're supposed to get from this parable, I think, is we're supposed to understand that there is a day of judgment coming, and we had better live our current life in a way that honors God, or we'll be on the wrong side of that judgment. I'm not talking about works-based salvation. I'm not saying any of that. Here's what I'm saying. If you've trusted in Christ that he's died on a cross for your sins and that he, he bodily rose from the dead. He wasn't a ghost. He rose from the dead and his grave clothes were still laying there. If you believe that and you've put your faith in him, meaning you've put your life on his line. In other words, I'm giving my life to you. I am going to be faithful to you from here on out. If you've done that and you are in God's family, and you don't have to worry about this scary story we just read. 
Because on judgment day, when there's an account that we all have to give, your account has already been settled. Isn't that going to be an awesome day? Where there's going to be... I mean, yeah, he's got the books up there, right? He's got the scrolls of everything we ever did. And, I, and, and best I can tell from what the New Testament authors tell us is when that scroll gets rolled out and we kind of, oh, no, please don't read that in front of everybody. He's going to say, you know, I don't need to read this because there's a big red stamp on it. It says paid in full, settled. No need to talk about it. It, it, maybe that stamp says, cast as far as the east is from the west. I'm signing up for that deal. I'm not signing up like the rich man did and said, I'm going to see if I can be good enough and wealthy enough that will buy me a place in the kingdom of God in eternity. That ain't going to work for you. The other thing I think that uh, Jesus is wanting us to understand from this is that those who seek to build their own kingdom in this life, and that's all you care about is building your own little kingdom, you're going to have a wall between you and the people who get eternal life, the people who sought the kingdom of God their entire life. Let me tell you something. I'll just give you my opinion. Our earthly kingdoms ain't worth squat. They're just not. They're going to burn up. They're going to rust. They're going to fade away. You can build the best thing you can ever imagine. Your kids are going to screw it all up when you leave. <laughs> not because they want to, but just because they don't love all the same things you love. They're not into the same things you were. You might have built, built something great. That's wonderful. But they're probably going to sell it. <laughs> because they'd rather do something different. So what... I mean, come on, are we going to spend our entire life trying to build something we can't keep? Or are we going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what he says is righteous? And all those other things will be taken care of. Look, I'm for seeking the kingdom, not my kingdom. My kingdom ain't worth fighting for. My kingdom is not worth striving for. I've done that before. I built my own kingdom, and it was a huge success until I realized that's not at all what I want. And I had to also get knocked off a high horse to realize it. So I can avoid you all that. You can just decide to learn from the rest of us idiots <laughs> and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to go the way out they went. I don't think I'm going to learn the hard way. Just seek the kingdom of God. Take every single day of your life. Wake up before your, your feet hit the floor and hold your hands out in a receiving posture like we prayed last week, and we're going to pray again in just a minute the same way. Hold your hands out in the morning and just say, God, whatever's going to come of this day, help me to honor you with it. Fill me with your spirit so that everywhere I go, your spirit invades. Your kingdom invades the kingdom of this world everywhere I go. Make me a citizen of your kingdom today, wherever I'm at and whoever I come in contact with. That's your daily seeking of the kingdom of God. You're asking for it to come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done down here as it is up there. Yes? That's what Jesus is after the rich man in this story and the Pharisees that uh, were the people he was symbolizing in this story, they were not seeking God's kingdom. They were seeking their own. They were seeking a literal national kingdom that would take over everything else. And Jesus says, that's not how we're playing this. My kingdom is not of this world. But it's coming. <laughs> So I would encourage you, through this story, to realize that God's kingdom should be the priority for us. That should be number one. Seek first God's kingdom. The family of God, especially in this country, those who call themselves children of God, we've got to wake up. 
we got to stop being the rich man in this story. If we don't, I fear that in the coming years, maybe the next five years, maybe the next ten years, maybe it's twenty, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's going to get rough. And God's people better be ready to stay faithful when the hard times come. So let's not, let's not end up like the rich man. Even if we're poor Lazarus with a disease and all the problems of the world on our shoulders, the hope we got in this passage today is that your life here may be really bad, but God helps. Even if it's in the next life. What your humble situation down here will be highly exalted in the kingdom of God and all of eternity. Yes? This is a lot of hope God's offering us. So I'm going to ask Drew to, to come sing and play for us. We're going to do our normal uh, time of worship and communion. Um, what I want to do for just a moment, last week we started praying kind of a new way. Okay, I call it the, the posture of prayer. It really matters, I think. So I'm going to ask you to stand um, and and I know a lot of us were raised in uh, cultures where we don't really do much with our hands during a worship service except for turn pages maybe um, but I, I want us to start learning this because I want you to start doing it on your own time not just at church we have began uh, last week we're starting our prayer like this you just hold your hands out this is a posture of receiving. We're going to receive something from God because what you do with your body, I think, connects to your brain and helps with your attitude. So I want to ask you to just stand here as we pray in just a moment. And what we're inviting God to do is we're inviting Him to fill us and to give us what we need to change us from the inside out. Do you want that? You want his spirit to change you? I sure do, because we're a mess without that, okay? So let, let's ask him to do it. So I'm going to ask you to hold your hands out just like this. We're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, we stand here in your presence. God, I pray that your spirit will fill everyone in this room, in this moment. We invite your spirit to come. Work in us based on what we've just heard and learned what you've been teaching us, will you change us from the inside out? God, give us, give us conviction over where we failed you. Turn our hearts toward you. Create in us a pure heart. Take all of our deception and our manipulation and our iniquity and our sin and our transgression. Forgive us and cleanse us. God, we, as your children, we know we have no hope at doing any of this right if we don't have your help. So God, will you make us like Eliezer? Will you make us a group of people who God helps? So we don't want to be like the rich man who's stuck on himself. And not even the afterlife could change him. God, we want to be changed now. We don't want to wait until we meet you face to face. We want to be prepared for that day. We want to please you in this life. We want our decisions to honor you and worship you. We want our Monday through Saturday to worship you, not just Sunday. So God, help us. We need your help. We live in the middle of a dark culture who's quickly turning away from you. God, help us to make a difference. There's so many people like this rich man in this story who have no clue how good you are and they're chasing everything the world is offering them. And in the meantime, they're destroying themselves and they don't even know. God, help us to be a light in that darkness. God, we... We don't want to see anybody 
shut out of your kingdom. We want everybody in just like you do. So God, give us your power and your spirit to go do everything we ought to, to change the things we need to change, and to offer hope to those who are hopeless in our community and in our homes and in our families. So God, we ask you in the next few moments as we worship you, we take communion to remember what all you've done for us. We invite your spirit to move and do whatever you want. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.